right, let's go and get started. Welcome to CS 2050. The topic of today is just more set theory. Uh, I am following a trend here where like there's three hours of lecture a week and the third hour I don't know what to do um, because we did everything important in the first two hours. So I'm, I'm going to, like we did on proofs, we did sort of advanced proof techniques. I'm going to talk about some, not advanced set theory or anything like this, but just more definitions of things that you may need or may have seen, right? So. Uh, this is just sort of the hodgepodge of all the definitions that are necessary in set theory. Um, when we take unions or intersections, we do like, you know, A, union B, union C, union D, union, I don't know, E, right? But that's kind of annoying, and it's really uh, ugly to, if you have like 20 sets and you want to take the union of them, it's not very polite to just write out a, a, a line of 20 things. So we do something called indexed collections. And you may be familiar with uh, this notation, like sum of i is equal to 0, uh, we'll say 1. We'll even say n. i n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over like n squared, right? You may be familiar with this notation from calculus, summations, sequences, things like this, right? Uh, anyone know what this specific summation is on the top of their head? This is not important at all, but I was just just curious if if, if you still if they still learn something calculus. I think this is pi squared over six. Um, no way anyone would, anyone should get that, but the proof it takes you know you take limits with uh, um, cotangents and things. Um, similarly, this big symbol here is a sum. It's a sigma, and sigma is for sum. And use sigma to represent like I'm adding too many things, and I don't want to talk about adding them all. So we can use giant letters in set theory as well. That's basically all an index collection is. Uh, for example, let uh, a i equal the set containing i and the set uh, the set containing i and i plus one. So a i is one set of two elements. Both those elements are numbers. Okay. I can do something like this. Let's say a consider the set um, S is equal to the union of i equals 1 to uh, 7 of a of i. Okay? Now here I've written a big union. In the same way you use a big sum, you use a big sigma, you just write a big capital U. And then you say i is equal to 1 to the top is where it's indexed. It, right? it stops, right? All of you should have some programming experience. The sum is like a, is like a for loop. The big union is also like a for loop, right? If we were to write this specific summation now, this would be a1, union a2, union a3, union a4, union, oh God, union a5, I'm already tired, union a6, union a7, okay? Now, I don't want to write that out with, that's like a lot of writing, so that's why it's useful to, to com compactify things using this nice big capital U. Uh, what is this set equal to? Yeah. It's only eight elements, one through eight. Um, here's an, a way to think about this specific set. Like, let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight. Um, uh, AI being I and I plus one basically is this, right? That's A, that's A1. And then A2 would be that. A3 would be that. So there is one element in every two of these sets, A1 and A2 both share the element A2, right? 8 is in here even though the sum goes to 7 because A8, uh, excuse me, A7 contains 7 and 8, right? This is sort of uh, just some practice with the, with, with the uh, uh, notations. Similarly, you can do, uh, consider the set S is equal to the in, inter, intersection of I equals 1 to 7 of A of I. Now, intersection, big upside down U, basically means you take the intersection of those sets, right? What is the intersection of AI? Two to seven. 
Two to seven? Wrong. Eh. Hmm? The null set? Yeah. So the intersection of, of, uh, of several sets is going to be uh, the intersection of all of them. So this is going to be A1 intersect A2 intersect dot dot dot. I'm using notation here. Intersect A7, right? So the intersection of several sets is going to consist of, all, of the elements that are in all of them. If you're very familiar with um, uh, Venn diagrams, if we have s like seven big circles, that's just four circles. We'll leave it at that. It's this tiny little area. Every time you take intersections and more intersections of things, things get the set you're intersecting should get smaller intuitively. So whatever this intersection is, is pretty small. Uh, why is it the empty set, though? If I asked you to prove it, why, was, why is it the empty set? What would, you, what would, what would be an argument? Uh, let's take uh, A1 uh, intersect with A3, and then it would be a, a non-set, and then non-set intersect with the others would be non-set. That's exactly, exactly. Yeah. So like, suppose there's, uh, let's say if uh, X is in some, is X is in S, then we know X is in each of the sets. So then by specification, let's say X is in A1, and X is in... I don't know, A5. So uh, A1, though, is equal to 1, 2, and A5 is equal to 5, 6. And no element is in both of those. So then there is no element in the whole intersection, right? Recall for any set S, the intersection with the empty set is simply the empty set, right? There are no elements in both. So that's basically what happens. The union gets too big. In, excuse me, the intersection in some sense gets too big. Now, here's one of the greatest advantages of doing index collections, is that it allows you to take an infinite union. This is an infinite summation, and you probably introduced that first. Before having the infinity sign to there, you would probably introduce like a finite summation, taking a sum of finitely many elements. But you could actually, like unions, you could do infinitely many intersections. What is, uh, or unions, what is i equals uh, zero, to infinity of AI. We're taking an infinite union. Now, this is kind of a big deal because you cannot write an infinite uh, formula, right? Any, anytime you write a formula, it has to be a finite sequence of symbols. You can't take an infinite or or an infinite and or anything like this, but you can index over an infinite set in this way. So in, you, can, you can take an infinite union if you can, you can index the union. So this is the way we would write an infinite union. What is this infinite union, though? For AI, again, is equal to a, I and I plus 1. This is just the natural numbers. We could prove this by double set containment, right? How would you prove this by double set containment? Let's try it. I didn't practice this, but let's try it. We prove uh, the naturals are a subset of the index I is equal to 0 to infinity of a of i plus 1, a, a, the union from i equals 0 to infinity of a of i, right? So let uh, n be some natural. Then n is an element of a of n. So uh, n is an element of the union of i is equal to 0 to infinity of a of i. Done, right? It's an element of the set, it's an element of the whole union. So we see that the set of natural numbers is a uh, subset of this union A1 to a, union A0, A1, A2, and so on, right? Now, if we were to prove the other way, the double set containment, what's an argument we could use for i equals 0 to infinity of A of i? We want to prove that this is contained in the naturals. How would we do so? Any any hypothesis about how we should well, like the throughout the course I'm going to emphasize proof techniques and how to demonstrate things. So if you had to declare a way to prove this, what would be your first attempt? Set. 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 
does belong to um, that entire infinite index collection. Mm -hmm. So to prove a double set containment, by the way, all you need to, to prove a containment, all you need to do is take one element in here, a generic element, and show it's an element of here. That's one way to do a containment. Although what you're saying might work, I think there's an easier answer. So will we just use i instead? Since that's a uh, basically, here, here's one argument that may not be like the most popular. Notice uh, a of i. Uh, notice that uh, for all i, that uh, a of i is a subset of the naturals. Trivially, each element is a number, so the set containing two numbers is therefore a subset of the naturals, and then the union of sets only containing numbers must be, therefore, uh, a subset of the naturals. So the union of i is equal to 0 to infinity of a of i uh, only contains numbers, natural numbers, in fact. Not the most important that you understand this proof, but just sort of uh, more intuition about things. Like, we have belief. And then we can assert the belief, we can certify it by a, by a proof, you know. If you had any doubts that that was true, then you could prove it that way. Okay? Um, you can also take the uh, infinite intersection of several sets and maybe get something interesting. Consider this set. Uh, I is equal to 1, we'll say n. n is equal to 1 to infinity of the interval 0 to 1 over n, open. What is that? First off, is that the empty set? Recall an interval is a set of real numbers um, is equal to the set of real numbers, x, such that uh, it's strictly, a is less than or equal to x, which is strictly less than b, right? So you have these sets of intervals on the, on the real line here. Uh, w is the infinite intersection of these intervals the empty set? Why not? Yeah, so it contains 0. So we know that 0 is an element of this intersection. Every interval has 0 as an element, right? What else is in this intersection? Smaller than what? For example, if n was 1, then it would be 0 through 1. So it would have like 1 half and um, all those numbers. So maybe let's do the first, the first two intervals. The first two intervals for n equals 1. Let's do n equals 1 and n equals 2. Let's take the intersection of 0 to 1 intersect with uh, 0 to 1 half. What is that? And what is that set? Yeah, this is a subset of this. Okay, so now let's take this and we intersect it again with zero to one third. What is that? Zero to one third. Okay, so then generalize your argument. What should be the infinite intersection? Yeah, it's a set containing 0, and that's it. So we have an infinite union of continuous sets. We're not defining continuity here, but you know these intervals from calculus. An infinite intersection, excuse me, of these continuous intervals gets you a set with one element in it. That's kind of interesting. Now, uh, how would you prove this? Let's prove it. Uh, we prove uh, that the that the uh, intersection of n is equal to to one. So we don't divide by zero. N is equal to one to infinity of the interval zero comma uh, one over n is equal 
to the set containing 0 and nothing else. Right? What, was, what would be your first proof strategy? Direct, contrapositive, contradiction? What would be the first thing you would do to try to prove this? Direct proof. So what would a direct proof look like, outline-wise? Um, basically saying that that, uh, that, set or that uh, statement on the left is going to equal, is only going to be equal to the set containing 0. There may be a direct proof of this. Uh, certainly 0 is in the set. But we would want to argue that there is no other element in the set. So I don't know how to do the direct proof for this, although I'm sure it exists. Instead, I know how to do a proof, of contra proof by contradiction for this one. So first off, we, we, let's prove it. Uh, notice that, let's call this set S. Notice that 0 is an element of S, like unconditionally. We don't need to prove that. That's sort of obvious by looking at it. So assume to the contrary. there exists some other element. Let's call it x. OK? Assume to the contrary, there's a second item in the list. Now, now what is the contradiction? What is assuming to the contrary this set is the empty, uh, the set is only the set containing 0? It's not the fact that the set is infinite or some interval or something like this, but the fact that the negation of the statement, the set is, the, this set, it, only contains 0 is that this set contains something else other than 0, right? Not that it's infinite or an or, uh, interval or anything like this, right? Um, since uh, x is an, must be then, if s is in the intersection, it must be in all of them, right? So since x is an element of 0 to 1, we know that uh, 0 is less than equal to x, which is less than uh, 1. But we also know that it's not, uh, and uh, that x does not equal 0. Because we're assuming that x is some element that's not 0, right? It's some second element. It's just distinct from 0. Um, x, is an, x is a positive number between 0 and 1. Uh, then there exists k such that uh, a k, a natural number, in fact, such that uh, 1 over k plus 1 is strictly less than uh, x, which is strictly less than 1 over uh, k, right? Would you agree that for every number between 0 and 1, you can find uh, that it sits between two fractions. In fact, one of these should be that one. Right. Every number sits between either one half and one third, or one third and one fourth, or one fourth and one fifth, and so on. Right? There's, there's. If you consider the sequence, uh, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one of those must be uh, less than it, and one of them must be greater than it. There exists a k for this to be true. Would you agree? Uh, but then. Um, x is not an element of the interval 0 to 1 over k plus 1. If it's strictly greater than k plus 1, x is not an element of the interval uh, one over, uh, 0 to 1 over k plus 1. So x is then not an element of s, contradiction, because that is an interval that's taken in the intersection. So not only do we know zero an element of this infinite intersection, we know that no other element is, is a element of this intersection. Any questions on this proof? This is not the most important uh, thing to know, but it's just a demonstration of the really the power of set theory. Like sets are so important that it turns out if you have sets, you don't need any other parts of mathematics. <coughs> you don't need numbers because you can use sets to pretend they're numbers. You don't need limits. You don't need functions. It turns out, almost perhaps accidentally, sets are so powerful that the axioms of set theory can explain all the other axioms 
of all the other little branches of mathematics. So you don't actually need any other rules. You just need only rules for sets. And from those rules, you can derive uh, special cases as rules for, for numbers, graphs, uh, intervals, whatever. Right? Here we sort of play with limits. Right? Um, any questions on this proof? OK. Let's talk about the next topic, which is a partition. Uh, we say a comma b are a partition of s if s is equal to a union b and a intersect b is equal to the empty set. So a partition you can think of as a way to break up the set S into subsets of S such that the union of those subsets creates back the whole set and that each partitioned piece is disjoint. So if you have some set S like this, let's call that S, a partition may look like this. It's A, B, C, something like this, right? So you can think of a partition as a way, if you were to do a Venn diagram, you crack open the piece into separate pieces. Now, A union A intersect B being disjoint means there's no elements that are in both of them, right? It's in one or the other. Now, you can even define an index collection of partitions, like uh, we say uh, A1, uh, A2 partition S if uh, S is equal to the union of I is equal to 1 of to infinity of AI. And if I does not equal J, uh, that implies that AI intersect AJ does not equal, excuse me, equals the empty set. What this means is that this, we would call the, these partition pieces pairwise disjoint. So you have perhaps many sets. 10 of them, infinitely many of them, whatever. You break up S into several pieces, and then each piece, for every two pieces, the intersection of those two pieces is empty. What we mean by that is we, we say that the partition pieces are pairwise disjoint, right? This is not necessarily something too hard. You just take something and crack it open, right? Um, give me any partition of the naturals. Let's partition the naturals into two sets. What would be the two sets you would choose first? OK, that's one. One to 100. Well, actually, zero. Zero to 100. One hundred one, one. Right? That's a partition. So you partitioned it into one finite set and then one infinite set. That's fine. Uh, what's another partition of the naturals? Yeah, the odds and the evens. No number is both even and odd. And we'll say E is equal to the set containing uh, some number uh, N is in the naturals, such that there exists K, uh, such that uh, N is equal to 2 times K. Right? That's the definition of an even number. And we say. We can define the odds in such a way that n is a natural and n is not an element of the evens. Or we could say 2k plus 1. <coughs> Both those are valid definitions of the evens and the odd numbers. Now, why is this a partition? Every number in the natural numbers is either even or it's odd. It's not neither, so it, is a part, it does uh, cover the whole set. And no number is both even and odd simultaneously. So they are pairwise disjoint. We get this property as well. It's a partition. Um, you can, in fact, partition, do all kinds of weird things with partitions. You can even partition uh, an infinite set into finite sets, each part, but infinitely many pieces, each of them finite. So you could do the naturals as uh, the union of i is equal to 0 to infinity of the set containing i. So what is this? This is an infinite union, an index collection of sets. Each set is a set of one element. 
So you have an infinite union of sets containing one elements, and therefore that's the whole naturals. So you, this is also not only uh, an index collection that equals the naturals, but it's a partition. Why? No two sets of this union are going to have a non-empty intersection, right? To write this out more explicitly, this would look like zero, the set containing zero, union, the set containing one, union, the set containing two, union, right? And from there, it's sort of ridiculously trivial that it is actually the naturals, right? Um, each, each of those is pairwise disjoint because they only each contain one element and no two elements are the same. Right. Any questions on partitions? Shows up uh, not the most often, but you need to know what the word partition. If we say a, if we say a, a collection of sets partitions some other set, you have to know that this is what they mean. They they break literally they break it up into pieces. Right. All right, let's talk about inclusion and exclusion. So we are going to be concerned much later in the course with counting. But for now, we want to talk about cardinalities of sets in terms of the operations that define them. You notice you take an intersection, maybe the set you're taking intersections with gets smaller. You take a union, maybe it gets bigger. Let's see if we can uh, rigorously figure out uh, what that is. So consider you have two sets A and B, OK? And they look like this. What would you conjecture is the cardinality of A union B in terms of A and B? Hmm? Give me a give me a, a guess of what you think the size of A union B is. Yeah. Cardinality of A plus cardinality of B minus the cardinality of A union B. Or uh, what's the yeah. yeah. That's called in inclusion exclusion. A first guess may be to not have this minus intersection term, right? If you have a sum of things, if you have a group of several things together then it's the number of items that you have. Again, here, let's suppose A and B are finite, so because we don't want to count infinites or anything weird. Let's suppose A and B are finite. Then the size of the intersection, excuse me, the size of the union should be the size of the pieces. But it turns out that's only true if the intersection of them is non-empty. Because what happens is you accidentally will double count the elements that are both in A and both in B. So you need to subtract off the intersection. Here's the, uh, uh, a quote unquote proof by Venn diagram we're not, this is uh, an allusion to the proof, and a proof by Venn diagram, of course, is not a proof, but we'll do it in a second, right? Suppose we want to count uh, A union B, okay? A union B looks like this. Okay. Uh, we want to consider the number of elements that are in A union B. So we can rewrite A union B in terms of its pieces. So we can write A in terms of uh, A, this is what? A minus B, and this is A intersect B. We can write B as um, uh, A intersect B, and then B minus A. We'll prove that a little more rigorously. But then when we add together uh, A and B, we actually overcount by a little bit. So if we say the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B, pictorially, we get half moon plus football plus other half moon plus football. But we need. Moon, moon, and only one football, right? So this is double counted. So then we need to subtract off the football. And the football is just A intersect B, right? So that's why you need to subtract off A intersect B. You accidentally double count it, because it's the elements that are in A intersect B are counted once in, 
when you count A, once you count B. Now, if A and B are disjoint, this is given. If A, B are disjoint, then uh, the cardinality of A union B is, must be cardinality of A plus cardinality of B. Right? That's just true trivially by counting objects. There's no overlap to double count or, or miscount. We're going to prove this in slightly more detail now. But this is basically what's going on. Now, again, a proof by Venn diagram is not a proof, but that's, that's, I mean, obviously, when you look at the picture, you combine shapes and sizes, you get everything that you want. Um, right. So first, we'll prove using the laws of thought that some set A is equal to A minus B union A intersect B. Okay. Now, what that is is this thing we've talked about here, where we have the set A, and then we actually drew it as A minus B, and then A intersect B. Why is that true? We'll do it in a second. And then from there, we should be able to uh, drive all we want. Right. So A. Now, again, proving things with the laws of thought for set theory, we don't want you to do this. But I'm going to demonstrate it anyway. Uh, we want you to do things using a double set containment. But for something trivial as this, it wouldn't hurt to apply it. right? So let me do that one. Just in a mental map. Now, when you do this, for, you should be doing this for propositional logic and not sets, even though we did give you the laws of thought for sets. Uh, A is equal. Convince yourself that this is equivalent to A intersect the union, uh, the uh, universe of discourse, right? What's the name of that law? Let's not remember it right now. But we believe that to be true, right? That's the definition of A. A is that which is intersected with the universe of discourse. Now, what is the universe of discourse? Everything in the universe of discourse is either in B or not in B, right? So, right? Everything that is either is B or isn't B. So therefore, the universe of discourse is equal to B union, B complement. Uh, what should we do from here? What's the next step? Distribution. Distribution. We're going to get A intersect B union A intersect B complement. What is A intersect B complement? One more time. A intersect B complement? Yeah. Done. DVD. We demonstrated we wanted to. Questions on this? Everything that's in A is either in B also or not in B. So that's the one way to think of that. Um, now let's proceed with the uh, rules. Consider um, A uh, union B. Consider all the elements in A union B, right? Uh, if X is an element of A union B, there are three cases. Uh, there are three cases for this. X is an element of A, uh, but not B. X is an element of B, but not A. And X is an element of both. So convince yourself, if X is some element of A union B, those are the only three possible cases that X could consider ourselves, right? Not only are those the three possible cases, but notice that n exactly one of those is true for every X in A union B. No X can be in two of those cases at once. So these three cases partition A union B, right? So not only so we can write A union B then as a union of three things. What is A but not B? How would we write that? A intersect B complement. Which is just A minus B, right? Yeah. So we get A minus B. How would we write 
B but not A? B minus A. B minus A. And then how would we write both A and B? A intersect B. A intersect B. We agree? It's either in A and not B, in B and not A, or it's in both. In, in some sense, in the background, what's going on here is we're, we're saying X is here, here, or here. So what are those? Those are the only three options, right? But notice that these three sets are disjoint. So they form a partition of A union B. So because they form a partition, we may write A, the size of A union B is equal to the size of A minus B plus the size of B minus A plus the size of A intersect B. Do we agree? Only because, they are, because they're a partition. Now, we're trying to prove the inclusion and exclusion principle only using the fact that if A and B are disjoint, then the, the union is equal to the union of the sets. Right? Um, now, this is tr certainly true. Let's complete it by saying, let's say, plus A intersect B minus A intersect B. Right? We just added on an extra plus A intersect B minus A intersect B, which is, this, which is zero. Right? A intersect, the cardinality of a set is always some number between zero and in, in, infinite. So A intersect B is going to be some number, 10. Well, then we do plus 10 minus 10. So this is the same thing as adding zero. Um, what is the cardinality of B minus A plus A intersect B? B. Why is that B? Well, we just proved that A is equal to A minus B intersect union A intersect B, right? Those are a partition of A. Those two things are certainly disjoint. So B minus A plus A intersect B is all the things that are in B and not in A, or all the things that are in B and in A. So the cardinality of this is a partition. This is just B. Okay. Now what is A minus B plus A intersect B? A. <laughs> now what is minus A intersect B? Well, we just got that. We just got to deal with that. Okay, QED. The cardinality of A union B is equal to the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the uh, minus A intersect B. Right? We sort of had to complete this by saying plus A and intersect B minus A intersect B, so we can have this plus intersect B to complete A. And then once we've done that, we have to we've accidentally overcounted by exactly that much, so we undercount by it again to equal it out. So then we're left with this minus A intersect B term. This is called the include. This is called inclusion exclusion. Inclusion-exclusion principle. It shows up often in many domains. Uh, when we learn about more advanced proof techniques, we'll, we'll show how to do it for arbitrarily many sets, like 27 sets. It's not, it's, for two sets, it's quite easy. But for several sets, it's a little more involved. Right. Any questions on inclusion-exclusion? Awesome. Let's take a 10-minute break.